My name is Dana Settles. I'm with the Development Department here at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I'm here with Lisa Kiko from the Gardens Conservancy. We're going to have a close conversation about our green space here at the Cathedral and the role that the Gardens Conservancy has played in, in maintaining and planning all um, that you see in, in our beautiful close. Um, I'd like to welcome Lisa Kiko. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thank you, Dana. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I will hide myself and, and start the show. Today, I'll take you through a brief history of the Conservancy, followed by a virtual walk through the gardens. The Conservancy is an all volunteer group that designs, maintains, and supports all of the gardens on the close. Many members have served for decades planning and implementing this urban oasis. Conservancy members may be found around the close in all seasons, planting bulbs in the fall, annuals in the spring, and caring for the flowers and shrubbery all year. Our gardener, Marilyn Budzanowski, maintains all the gardens. The Conservancy has been in existence for 116 years in one form or another. It began in 1908 as the, as the Diocesan Auxiliary and was incorporated in 1911 to provide voluntary assistance to the cathedral by supplying flowers and linens, as well as vestments for the clergy and surplices for the choir. In 1952, the auxiliary changed its name to, to the Cathedral Guild in part to avoid confusion with the Women's Auxiliary. In 1958, the Cathedral Guild paid to re-landscape and plant shrubs on the cathedral grounds. In 1964, maintenance of the gardens and grounds became the organization's primary focus. Then in 2011, our name changed to the Cathedral Gardens Conservancy. Now let me say a few words about the Cathedral Close. The Close is defined by all the surrounding land and buildings belonging to the Cathedral. Cathedral Gardens Conservancy maintains roughly five acres of the 11 acre close. The close is bordered on the north by a driveway and an elegant handicap ramp and a recently renovated garden. This area is not part of the Conservancy's purview. To the east is Morningside Drive. A retaining wall was recently completed to shore up the steeply sloping land. This area is also not maintained by the Conservancy. Along the southern border, 110th Street, are Synod House and Diocesan House, where the Conservancy maintains three gardens. Bordered on the west by Amsterdam Avenue, the west entrance garden is along the south wall of the cathedral. It is the first garden visitors see upon entering the close. The close was designated an official New York City landmark in 2017. The cathedral church and the close are served by roads and walkways placed among lawns, gardens, playgrounds, and parking with a variety of artistic and religious objects, sculpture, and furniture. These features took shape organically around the construction of the buildings rather than by a master plan for landscape design. In 2007, the cathedral entered a 99 year lease agreement with Avalon Bay Communities to build an apartment tower on the southeast corner of the close. The land was eventually sold in 2019, and a rose garden and a playground were lost to this development. The gardens are open to the public Saturdays and Sundays, dawn to dusk. Now let's take a look at our gardens. The Conservancy maintains seven gardens on the cathedral grounds and maintains hedges throughout. The gardens are the pulpit green, the Biblical Garden, Meditation Walk and Green Room, the Avalon Garden, Garden of Seven Generations, Garden at Ogilvy House, Synod House Garden, and the West Entry Garden. I'll start with the Pulpit Garden, the green area shaded on the map. This is the largest garden. With its border of flowering shrubs and perennials, it is a pocket of calm in the busy neighborhood. In the center of the lawn is a 40 foot high Gothic spire of carved Daytona stone. Its four sides bear reliefs of an eagle, a winged lion, a winged ox, and an angel, the symbols of the four evangelists. The spire was erected in the early phases of the cathedral's construction when services were often held outside to serve as a pulpit for mass. 
The design and construction of the pulpit was underwritten by Olivia Felt Stokes, an American writer and benefactor in memory of her sister, Caroline. The sisters were known for their charitable work and funded a range of projects, including St. Paul's Chapel at Columbia University and Woodbridge Hall at Yale. Their nephew, Isaac Newton Felt Stokes, founded the architectural firm Howells and Stokes, which was commissioned to design the pulpit. A portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Isaac Felt Stokes by John Singer Sargent is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 2009, the Conservancy was asked to take over the maintenance of the borders of the pulpit green, which until then had been maintained by a dedicated group of volunteers. Annual bulb planting brings the garden to life in the early spring. Next, we have the biblical garden, the blue shaded area on the map. Situated along the south side of the cathedral, this garden has had many alterations and redesigns over its 50 years. It is the jewel in the crown of our gardens. Established in 1973, it was updated in 1988, then underwent a major renovation in 2001, at which time the meditation walk was created. New, a new fountain was donated in 2007 and the green room planted in 2008. And today the garden is the focus of a new uh, replanting scheme. The Biblical Garden was established in 1973 by Mrs. Sarah Larkin Lowing, a writer and active member of the Anglican Church and head of the Conservancy. The garden was designed by C. Powers Taylor, the owner of the Rosedale Nursery in Hawthorne, New York, who tried to create something as it might have been in biblical times. With a limited budget, paths were created with earth-colored concrete and plant selection limited to date palms and olive trees in pots. Space for the green room was created to separate the entrance of the biblical garden from the active service entrance and driveway. In 2001, the Conservancy undertook a major renovation of the garden, spending approximately $100,000 with the help of landscape designer Keith Corlett. The original garden design was more organic in its layout, and this renovation created a more formal arrangement of quadrants and paths. The garden's various plantings are all species mentioned in scripture with a guide to the plantings located near the entrance. Corlett designed the lovely Gothic wooden seating shelters and colorful mosaics that were inset in the paths. A small bubbling water feature rose out of a large mosaic in the center of the garden. The meditation walk was created along the side of the cathedral, as shown in the green area on the map. Today, the 65 square foot garden has a cross-shaped layout, Gothic canopied seating areas, and the Gallatin limestone fountain in the center, all echoing features of the cathedral's architecture. The covered benches, shady trees, and bubbling fountain of the biblical garden combine to provide a quiet retreat and place for reflection. In this slide, you can see some of the lovely details, a Gothic style covered bench, one of the ceramic mosaics inset in the path, covered entrance seating and the early summer garden in bloom, and the detailed map and plant list that are located at the entrance. The fountain was a gift from the then president of the board in honor of her late husband, James Gallatin. It was designed by Chris Pelletier, who was an artist in residence at the cathedral. He used motifs found on other sculptures around the cathedral and incorporated them into the design of the fountain. The tranquil gurgle from the fountain blocks out the noise of the city. As the beauty of gardens are often ephemeral, you can see in these photos how the garden changes through the seasons and years. In 2008, the green room was planted to provide a serene area leading to the biblical garden. A Stuartia tree was chosen for its beautiful summer camellia-like blooms, fall, lovely fall leaves and bark. Hedges include Euonymus and Yew. Pachysandra covers the ground dotted with daffodils in the spring. Along the cathedral wall, the meditation walk was created when the biblical garden was renovated in 2001. It is edged with boxwood, 
and was initially planted with a variety of herbs, including pineapple sage, bronze fennel, rosemary, and lavender. After many years of growth, the trees in the biblical garden block the sunlight to this area. Recent tree pruning will allow us to plant herbs here again. Our third garden is the Avalon Garden, shaded here in pink. At the corner of Morningside Drive and 110th Street, there was once a rose garden, which was a gift of Patrick Cullen, a scholar of Renaissance history. This is the garden that was lost to the development of the Avalon apartment building. The Avalon Bay Communities commissioned and built this Avalon garden to, to replace the rose garden. In 2009, the landscape architecture firm of Rader and Cruz was hired to design the garden between the new apartment building and the Ossian House. The designers described the project as follows. The construction of a new apartment building required the relocation of the cathedral's rose garden. The garden is at the level of the cathedral close overlooking 110th Street, 30 feet below. Roses were saved from the previous garden and planted with a selection of perennials suitable to the site. A flexible planting bed arrangement allows volunteer gardeners to maintain discrete areas while still forming a coherent whole. Stone walks, walls, and a trellis frame the garden. The trellis incorporates a long bench and a storage shed. Here are photos of the completed project showing the casual perennial beds and the trellis bench. Next, we have the Garden of Seven Generations. This is a small garden nestled between Senate House and Deocian House and is easily overlooked. The garden is the home of a lovely sculpture and is bordered by shrub hedges with a grass lawn to set up to set off the sculpture by Frederick Frank. This sculpture was inspired by the Constitution of the Iroquois Nations and it reads, in all our deliberations, we must be mindful of the impact of the decisions on the seven generations to follow ours. Our fifth garden is the garden at Ogilvy House. This is a private garden used only by the bishop and his family for entertaining clerical dignitaries and the Conservancy annual tea. It is beautifully hidden behind hedges and flowering trees that protect the garden from public view. This is actually the back of the Ogilvy House. The garden is dominated by an antique stone basin. The photos show how it has evolved over the years. The front gardens at Ogilvy House consist of evergreen shrubs and ground covers, primarily Vinca and Pakistan. A photo dated from 1915 shows early shrub plantings and a very sunny exposure. It now sits in the shadow of the apartment tower. Our final garden runs along the south side of the cathedral and is sometimes called the West Entry. I, I totally missed something here. <laughs> Next up is the intimate Synod House Garden, that little purple spot in the lower right on the map. This garden sits at the corner of 110th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. The yews in the garden hide the chain link fencing and soften the traffic noises from the busy intersection. Now our final garden runs along the south side of the cathedral and is sometimes called the West Entry Garden. In 2009, the cathedral hired the esteemed landscape architectural firm of Matthews Nielsen to design foundation, foundation planting suitable for the huge cathedral building. The garden design included the adjacent playground for the cathedral school. This elaborate and involved <laughs> this elaborate and involved design included grading the hillside and installing irrigation. Sadly, almost none of the plantings exist today, but the playground is still enjoyed by the children. And here we credit the architectural firm for their work. Now let's take a look at where, where we are now and some of the projects moving forward. Up to this point, you've seen how the gardens look at their best, blooming flowers and lush green foliage. Today, a few of the gardens need significant attention to bring them back to life. They are the West Entry Garden, 
Avalon Biblical and Ogilvy House Gardens. Starting with the West Entry Garden, building projects in and around the cathedral have resulted in plants being removed, trees cut down, and damaged soil. Here at the main entrance to the cathedral are just dirt and small perennials transplanted from other areas of the gardens and weeds. Much work needs to be done to make a beautiful garden entrance. And in the Avalon Garden, there seems to be significant boxwood blight. The hardscaping is actually falling apart. The underlayment of the gravel is now revealed and is a trip hazard. Paths are sloped and covered in a fine gravel that is slipping down the grade towards the street. This in turn is clogging the drains and creating issues for the retaining wall on 110th Street. The garden shed is rotting along its base and needs repair. In the biblical garden, plants of the big renovation of 2001 are mostly gone or overgrown. Major tree pruning and tree removal was performed this past fall. All the boxwood was infected with blight and have been removed. Spring blooming bulbs have been planted and a new planting scheme is being designed for installation this year. Ongoing maintenance of the fountain should be done weekly, but sadly never is. At Ogilvy House, the Conservancy is considering the purchase of a new urn to replace the cracked and unsafe existing one. And more Belgian block is needed to finish the garden edging. As you see, we have some ambitious plans ahead of us. We are so proud to be the caretakers of these lovely gardens at a very special place in New York City. We hope you can visit them when the flowers are in bloom, Saturdays and Sundays, dawn to dusk. And thank you. That's it. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, we have a few questions and um, in the chat, and if anyone has any additional questions, let me know. Um, you can uh, raise your raise your hand. Um, uh, but you can do that in the reactions below. Anyway, so um, Priscilla asks, how many volunteers maintain the gardens? Well, we primarily have, um, as I mentioned, Marilyn Budzanowski as the gardener, and uh, we have not too many, frankly, <laughs> about uh, two or three. One one very um, consistent volunteer. I'll go in <laughs> often, not often enough, and um, it's not as coordinated as it could be. It's, it, it's hard to coordinate volunteers, actually, but we'd love to have more. Sure. Um, and then the next question in the chat, and then, um, Marsha, I'll get to you. Um, so Neve is asking, what is the Conservancy's process of designing the gardens? We're not working with hired landscapers. Um, right now, there is mostly maintenance of the garden. The biblical garden, um, we are working, we're looking to renovate that in a very big way. We have lots of the old plans. Um, we are limited to the um, plants that are mentioned in the Bible or varieties of them that grow in our um, climate. And so we'll be referring to those. I will be doing a lot of the designing. Um, having just gotten my Master Gardener certificate. Um, and I'll be working with Marilyn, who really understands what grows there and works well. We did just do the major uh, pruning, which will allow uh, for a lot more sunlight and a lot more uh, colorful flowers to exist there. Oh, I'm excited to see it. Me too. <laughs> okay, Marsha, what is your question? Hi. Okay, first of all, thank you. I, I mean, I've enjoyed the gardens for many, many years, going back to when, uh, what was Kraft, what was his first name? I forget, forget his first name, but through the various you know, incarnations of the gardens, and they're just beautiful. You may see what's wrong, but we see what's beautiful. My question has to do with volunteers. I'm always looking for ways that the people who worship there on Sunday might want to get more engaged and things that the cathedral is doing during the week. And I wonder if there is a process, we can always you know, put out a call if you're interested in volunteers. And we, I could ask you even to write something uh, to put in our weekly newsletter. So if anybody is interested in spending some time you know, doing work in the garden under your direction, they would be able to do that. Just let me know. Well, thank you very much. I think that's wonderful. And I think we'd have to come up with a schedule um, right. to make 
So we're, yeah. That's no promises, but is there an opportunity here? You know, that's, that's my question. Oh, we'd love it. Okay. Um, well, we'll be sending, uh, I know, uh, our information and Lisa's uh, information, if that's okay, out to people so um, they can get in touch with someone from the Gardens Conservancy and support in any way that they like. Uh, thanks, Marcia. Um, and then um, for John from Holy Trinity said, uh, do the Avalon Apartments have responsibility for repairing and or renovating the Avalon Garden? So I guess, do they may help maintain it at all? They do not. Um, it is something that we uh, will be looking into because it, it has structural issues that are expensive and possibly way beyond what we could do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good question. Let's see. Oh, um, how did you become involved in the Gardens Conservancy, Lisa? I was asked by a friend who was on the board. <laughs> If I would jo join, she knows that I am an avid gardener. Um, I have a big garden um, up in Connecticut, and uh, I really love to garden. And so this just seemed a, a perfect fit for me, and I've been delighted to be a part of it for two years now. That's wonderful. Okay, and then what is your favorite garden here? My favorite garden here? Mm -hmm. I have to say is the biblical garden. Um, I prefer a classical symmetrical layout to a garden. Uh, it's a beautiful parterre. It's, it's a style that I particularly like. I do, however, feel that once the Avalon garden structural issues uh, are addressed, it has the potential to be really quite a beautiful garden. It's south facing, it gets uh, tremendous sun. Uh, it's on 110th Street, which is a really wide street. So the buildings across don't block any of the sunlight. It could be quite beautiful. No, I, I, I still think it's beautiful, even with like <laughs> slightly. Well, it's still bloom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's still a lovely place to eat lunch in the summer. Um, but um, can you tell us about the garden party fundraiser you hold? Um, when, when does that happen? And we'll, yeah, what goes on with that? Well, it is our one and only fundraiser. Uh, we call it our annual tea. It's um, this year, it will be May, Thursday, May 2nd. And um, if you'd like to be on our invite list, please send your email to me and we can see what we get you on that. And um, that that is the one and only uh, fundraiser. As I said, it is hosted uh, by the bishop and it's in the garden, the Ogilvy House Gardens. And it's really in inclement weather, it's in the house, but if it's nice, which should be in May 2nd, it would be outside, which is lovely. Okay, um, thank you so much. Yes. Um, oh, are the gardens available to people visiting the church? Uh, they uh, indeed they are, uh, but only Saturdays and Sundays. Um, we have a lot of school children on the grounds and for security reasons, uh, we can't just have passersby in the gardens with them. So it is Saturdays and Sundays. So um, I think that's all of our questions. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us today and learning more about the Cathedral Gardens Conservancy and, and, our, and our green space on the close. Um, I know that if you live in the neighborhood, it is your park space and everyone, um, I, I hope many people can get um, can get involved if they wish. Um, once again, um, my colleague Emma Reber will be sending you the, the link to the video um, early next week, uh, along with how many, the myriad ways you can get involved with the Gardens Conservancy. Um, and so um, thank you so much again, and we hope to see you around the close really soon. Thank you.